Now we'd like to introduce our great opening keynote, Mercy Shabembe. Mercy is a great keynote speaker and she's gonna be joining us. She's from the UK. She's an award-winning activist who uses her story of growing up with HIV to educate, challenge, and inspire. Mercy works on youth engagement and participation across pediatric clinical trials and research. Mercy is passionate about ensuring that the voices of young people are centered in decision and process that impact their lives. As a speaker and consultant, she regularly works with organizations to embed community-led practice and capacity building within their work. She's a health journalist, passionate about sharing key scientific developments with communities directly affected. So please, everybody, welcome Mercy, and uh, let's hear this great keynote. Thank you for joining us, Mercy. Thank you so, so much for having me. And it is an absolute privilege to have been able to follow such incredible poems. Thank you so, so much. I'm really grateful as well to be in this space um, and yeah, spend this time with all of you. So the title of my talk is Unashamed Yet Unsupported as I feel that from my experience of the work that I've done but also being a black young person that often black young people are told by everybody you don't have to be you know ashamed of being you and and there is such a joy to being authentically you however in order to fully thrive um, we can't exist in environments and structures that completely leave us out of being supported uh, could I have the next slide please so, uh, as I've said, my name is Mercy and you've heard a little bit about me. So, yes, I have around eight years experience in global advocacy for children and young people. I started when I was around 16. Um, I'm originally from Zambia. Um, I loved the line in the poem earlier, which talked about um, how the future is marinating in the hands, the palms of Mother Africa. I just, that was beautiful. Um, so I'm very proudly, yeah, Zambian. Uh, and when I was five, moved to the UK with my family. Um, I'm also a grant maker, so I'm working on a fund in the UK, which is a 10 million pound commitment to black children and young people in the wake of everything that happened in 2020, which um, I often talk about as the delayed recognition of racial inequality. Um, and it's great to be able to have a role where I can resource movements and people that really embody what it is to serve and support black children and young people. I'm also uh, a non-executive director of an organization called the Social Innovation Partnership, which is a consultancy that works with organizations and um, businesses and individuals to make the world a more just, fairer place. Um, and I'm also a writer and a speaker. So I'm really looking forward to speaking to you all today. So I talked about moving to the UK when I was five and I had a relatively normal childhood. Um, I grew up with my younger sister, my two parents. I went to school, I played sports, I, you know, did what little kids do. And one thing that I later learned was not normal about my childhood was that I attended regular doctor's appointments um, around every three months and um, had blood tests and I took medication every single day. I just thought the world has an amazing healthcare system. That's what a kid thinks, right? If that's all they've known. Um, however, one day I went to the hospital with my family and was sat down and everybody looked very serious. And I was on um, school break at the time. So I was wondering why I was here and why everybody was looking so serious. And they sat me down and they started to speak to me about red blood cells and white blood cells. And I've never been sciencey, so I was not at all interested. But eventually they came around to say, we're trying to tell you that you're born with HIV and this is what it will mean for you. At the time, I hadn't really heard anything about HIV, so there wasn't any immediate thoughts. But actually what came after in that conversation um, was really the first time I ever thought about this funny word stigma. They started to talk to me about how HIV is perceived in society um, and that this will have a greater impact on my life ultimately than the actual virus, which um, is, you know, easy to handle if you're able to have access to medication and healthcare. Could I have the next slide, please? So really, the years following have been a journey in understanding the different types of stigma that intersect with my life. And I think that this really links to the stigma that Black young people face when thinking or talking about 
mental health. So public stigma for me, there's a lot of messages out there in society about what it means um, to live with a long-term health condition um, and particularly what it means to live with HIV. And I've definitely grappled with that. And I know that in the mental health space, it's exactly the same. I think in recent years, particularly in the UK, we've definitely become much better at talking about mental health. There've been a lot of campaigns. Um, our Royal Family also did some work around it. And so it was was very much sort of one of those things that was always on the news so there's been much more talk about it but there's still a lot of public stigma the other thing is self-stigma and I think this is what caught me off guard because so often stigma is obviously an external thing but actually realizing when you've internalized um, the harmful narratives that are out there is really important to ensuring that you can have good mental health um, because it's so easy to get caught in you know different negative narratives when they're all around you. There's also perceived stigma, which for me, I've definitely had instances where I've kind of thought that there would be stigma um, and assumed. And I know uh, later in my discussion, um, I'll talk a bit about the data in the UK. And this is definitely something that plays into how black young people access um, or don't access mental health services and support. And there's also structural stigma, which is obviously within structures and the way in which policies and systems um, and the ways in which institutions work um, that can often have stigma within it. And finally, stigma by association. I know from my experience um, of living with HIV, my younger sister is um, HIV negative. And there were so many times where um, I felt like if I told people that she would lose out on things, that she would lose friends and um, you know people that she liked and loved in her life because of me. And I know that for so many people who have experienced challenges to their mental health and um, this has been a reality um, and I know that this really feeds into that kind of overarching public stigma could I have the next slide please so um there was a show in the UK that came out um I think it was during 2021 last year and um, might have been the year before my COVID timelines are all over the place. It all just rolls into one. So um, I, yeah, the TV show was uh, looking at the experience of HIV in the UK in the 80s. And I had a chance to reflect on it. And um, I, yeah, had written these words and I felt that they really resonated with what I want to talk about today. So I, I say in this quote that stigma kills and actually it shows up in ways that are really quite intimate and personal. So for me, it shows up in my ability, my inability to meet someone's eyes when I'm sharing my HIV status, when I trip up on my words, struggling to explain that HIV has changed. I can live a full, normal, healthy life. The shame that seeps in when questions loaded with blames are the response to me sharing my status and at times being unable to just say those three letters. I feel really lucky to have been able to share my status, but stigma always reminds me of my perceived place in society. People still hold tightly to their perceptions of people living with HIV and they're often dehumanizing and I'm often othered and cast aside in certain situations where I choose to share this. And I really want to reflect on this because for so many of the conversations and reflections I've had about um, mental health when it comes to black children and young people, um, stigma is such a big part of how much you can thrive, flourish and recover. Um, you may you know be able to get all the sort of medical and clinical help you need but ultimately if you're still stacked up um you know with all these barriers in relation to stigma you're not going to be able to thrive fully so i wanted to end this bit with just um a short video clip from um an organization in the uk called chiva and um, that stands for the children's hiv association um and they've done uh is about a 15 minute video we'll just watch the first couple of minutes um but there's there's a little song in there done by um the actors that i feel really encapsulates stigma and what it's like to grow up with hiv so please play that thank you
I was 13 when I was told. I was just eight years old. I found out on my 15th. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. I was given medicine by a syringe. My parents knew since my birth. I was told by a nurse. It felt like a curse. It was my mum that broke the news. I thought I was going to die. Not me. I put it aside, I didn't cry. I was playing footy, full of energy, fighting fit. <laughs> I wasn't ill. They told me to sit. I never sit. Three nurses, two doctors and a specialist said I had HIV. I was confused, it meant nothing to me. They assume you understand, but I really didn't know what it was, it didn't land. <laughs> I thought it wasn't a big deal, I mean, I took it as a joke, but... Then I saw my mum and she was choked. In total shock, like, brimming with tears, and only then, only then, did I feel fear. This thing I had must be bad. Why else would mum be sad? When I was young, my mum died of cancer. I don't know if that's true, but when I asked, that was the answer. I grew up with it, in and out of hospital all the time. I took medication every day, but I didn't know why. I thought it was part of being a kid, that that was what all children did. Then in year eight, we had a lesson on STDs. So I asked my grandparents, do I have HIV? They looked surprised, thought I already knew. But honestly, I didn't have a clue. It was never spoken about, then one night it came up on TV. It was my parents and me. Comic relief made an appeal from Malawi. Some despairing kids and their dying mum. There was a silence in the room. I felt numb. I thought, is that what I've got? It can't be, I'm totally healthy. Those images are still with me. My mum said, never tell anybody. People will reject you. They'll know you got it from me. Just lie. Like a fool, at primary school, I broke her rule. I told a friend who told his mum, who was scared and shared it with the headmaster, who broadcasted it faster than a newscaster during a national disaster to all the staff. And then my mum got called in, hauled in to explain the appalling tale. By then, everyone knew. The head asked... Is it true? No. So she didn't get it through you? No. Neither of us have HIV. Oh, good. Because I didn't think you were that kind of woman. What the hell did he mean? It's obscene to demean people like that, as if you're to blame and have to feel shame. It's not my fault, and it's not my mum's fault. There's no enigma to the stigma. People are stuck in the past. If I take my medication with dedication, then my viral load is undetectable. Yeah, undetectable. There's a very simple equation. U equals U. Undetectable equals untransmittable. And untransmittable means you can't get it from me. And you can't get it from me. Not through sex. If we had a baby, it wouldn't have HIV. It's outrageous. People think it's contagious. You can't get it from a kiss. From piss on the floor. From touching my door. From drinking my drink. From licking my sink. From touching my skin. From the clothes I'm in. From holding my hands. We haven't got AIDS. No, they're not the same. We won't die. We're totally fine. We don't need your pity. We just need you to be educated. At school, it's taught as an STD. But that's not how I got HIV. It's still saying if you get it, you die. But that's a lie. It's just a way of scaring guys into wearing a condom, but that's not why you should use a condom. Whenever you have sex, you should put one on. It's a manageable medical disease, like asthma or diabetes. But for some reason, it's not the same. Diabetics don't hide away in shame. They take meds just like us. So what's the fuss? Why is HIV used to cuss? My mother won't let me tell my brothers, so I'm not going to tell others. I lie to my own kith and kin. And that's another thing. I got it, but my siblings didn't. Even at home, I keep it hidden. When I found out, I shut down. Headphones on, and I shut down. Skeptics on, you know it. Don't let it show. Shut down. Let no one know. Shut down. Can't talk to my folks. Shut down. Bad taste jokes. Shut down. Don't tell friends. Shut down. Boyfriends, girlfriends. Shut down. Don't let it show. Let no one know what I'm going through. Cause I shut down. Don't talk to me. Shut down. HIV. And I shut down. Thank you so much. Um, we'll pause it there and the full video is available on YouTube. But that feeling of feeling shut down encapsulates the, the stigma and mental health challenges that I faced in response to yeah, my journey growing up with HIV and I'm really glad to see the comments. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really, really good piece of work. And I'm, yeah, um, I will put the link in the chat 
just after this. Thank you. Um, could we skip past the next slide, please, and go to the following one? Thank you. So I'm now going to talk about two examples in the UK that are responding to um, yeah, challenges in mental health for black young people that I think are incredible examples. So I'll start with this one, which is Home Girls Unite. Um, and they had this quote in an article they did in Teen Vogue, and I loved it because it encapsulated the experience. So immigrant daughters are the glue of the family. We're the linguistic conduit between our parents and their new home. We learn to fill out paperwork even when we don't understand it fully. We help our mothers with their English tests and assignments. We'll sit on hold on the phone while struggling with math homework. We also have perks, an extra passport, additional language, an exciting culture and delicious food. I wanted to share this because um, I've highlighted in blue some of the extra um, burdens and challenges of what, um, what is required of black young people. I've spoken about um, me being an immigrant, when I first moved to the UK, I didn't speak a word of English um, and I really relate to a lot of what is happening here um, because you you balancing childhood and adolescence with the expectations and the opportunities and challenges of being an immigrant. So Home Girls Unite is a group for eldest immigrants, eldest immigrant daughters to all come together. Um, and essentially get support. So they provide access to therapy. They have um, these things called rant sessions, um, which I think is super cool. Um, and they create amazing content um, on self-care and um, on particular topics that eldest immigrant daughters have um, asked them to speak about. Um, and they also do provide support for people who might not be the eldest, but have similar experience. So please do check them out because their work is beyond the UK if you'd like support. I can see people in the chat are saying it's relatable. So I'm glad to see that. Could I have the next slide, please? So the key characteristics of Home Girls Unite, which is why I wanted to spotlight them today, was that they reflect that black young people are not a monolith. And I think so often um, in response to mental health, um, they can be a very much a one size fits all. Um, we spoke to three black people. So, you know, we, we know exactly what it takes to support black people with their mental health, but actually, what Home Girls Unite have managed to do is really hone in on a, um, I don't want to call it a niche because it feels like such a universal experience, but they've honed in on a particular aspect and part um, of what it means to be a black young person and understood um, how to create a culturally competent and confident space. So um, for those of you who will check them out and click on the link, you can see throughout their comms, throughout their website, everything they do, they know exactly who their audience is and that makes me feel at ease when I think about accessing that service or signposting that service to others and um, it's really important that when we talk about black young people we recognize the plurality of what that means and that there are communities within communities um, and that every black young person is an individual and will need different things um, and there is not a one size fits all um, in any way shape or form could I have the next slide, please? So um, Young Changemakers is a campaign led by a couple of organizations in the UK that I also think are absolutely incredible. And they were set up to promote equality in mental health. And again, create a culturally competent mental health um, service um, that can speak to the needs of young people from racialized backgrounds. Um, so it was set up in response to the systemic inequalities highlighted by the really disproportionate impact of the pandemic. And they have four social strands um, that are youth led. So these are policy influencing, engaging frontline practitioners, changing public attitudes and peer to peer support. Um, I should have done this, but I will find the link to the report they recently released. Um, and I'll put it in the chat later because it's a really good report but again they recognize that young people are not a monolith but also that young people are the leaders of the future um i think i mentioned earlier that you know i've had eight 
amazing years of experience and that's only been possible um, because people have trusted in me as a young person um, to lead and take the way and young people I see across all of the work I do and also my lived experience should be the architects and designers of the solutions that their communities face. Um, there's some really interesting research being done in the UK on the experiences of black children and young people throughout COVID as well. And um, I, I was just reminded of this when talking about Home Girls Unite that there's some really interesting stuff coming out as well around the gender differences um, between experiences of lockdown, homeschooling, the expectations on black boys and the expectation on black girls and how those differ in the home as well. Um, so there's definitely um, a need to ensure that we're nuanced and tailored in our research, our services, everything that we do to support black young people. Um, and also the flip side is that when we don't, actually the services and the support we offer might just magnify existing traumas than actually respond to them and make them better. Um, there's also another organization, which I haven't put in my slides, but they do incredible work and they're called Black Minds Matter. And they were set up again in 2020. And um, they are a service that supports black people in the UK to access a black therapist. Um, and so they pair you together and it is free, um, free to access as well. And um, so they generate their own funding and income in order to sustain that model. So please do check them out because they are also absolutely incredible. Um, I have a question um, on the next slide that I would like you to all take. Ooh, actually, I think I may have taken it out. Um, so I don't have a question, but I was going to prompt everybody to maybe share um, any examples that you've had um, in your own work that you would like to share as well. Um, and there's a this quote which I thought was really important. So the work that the young change makers are doing um, is really groundbreaking in the UK because it's supported by an organization called the Center for Mental Health, which in the UK um, is one of the main organizations involved in um, in like the sector, if you if I can call it that. And um, they really were challenged and caught a task on um, their work within black communities and for black communities um, and this project is an example of them taking steps to understand and address the inequalities that they have not previously addressed so um, the chief executive said this which I felt was really really true so racism is toxic to mental health our research working with young people has highlighted the impact of racial injustice on their mental health and how this gets reinforced in the experiences of mental health support. This is an excellent opportunity for racialized young people to be at the heart of research and evaluation to get a more accurate picture of their experiences. She says, their voices have been missing from the debate. We have a lot to learn and we hope it will drive real and lasting social and system change. I might disagree that their voices have been missing. I think they've been excluded. But what she says there is exactly right. It's got to be about social and system change. One part of the ecosystem cannot overturn everything that is needed to in order to support Black children and young people better with their mental health. I believe the question is actually on the next slide as well. Um, so yeah, please do share any examples that you have um, in the chat and I'll just give you two minutes just to think about it because I'm awful with on the, on the, stop, on the spot questions. So I'll just give you a minute or two to think of any good examples. Cool, I will move on to the next slide and I'm loving the chat. So thank you so much everyone for your contributions. So I want to focus the kind of final bit of my talk thinking about three things. So I've already said that I'm from, um, I'm from the UK and I'm gonna talk a bit about the UK context. Um, and the big caveat I will put up front is that um, black communities and data 
um, which I'm sure is the experience across the world because I've, I've seen that too, but um, the collection of data and the use of data um, is not an equitable experience. And so that is my caveat for the data that we have. Um, we don't have enough of it, firstly, and secondly, the ways in which it's collected um, is often, oh, I've forgotten the word I'm thinking of, but uh, the word is weaponized um, against uh, black children and young people. So um, I've seen in the chat as well, um, uh, Karen's just put a comment in about worrying that professionals will contact parents or schools and share details. And that is exactly the case in terms of data collection. And so I just want to really say that upfront before I share all of this data that I am um, aware of the, uh, I guess the flaws and the challenges in collecting this data. So I want to focus first by talking about the risk factors to black children and young people. Um, firstly, I wanted to talk um, about how the perception of blackness means that black children and young people are at risk. I know, People will know this, but I just want to say that blackness in itself is not a risk. Um, I think that we can give out messages that because certain communities are more at risk for things, that their, their identity itself is a risk, and that is not the case. Um, it's the structural and systemic inequalities and environments around them that create those risks, not the individual or person themselves. So for black children, young people, um, they often face a lack of proportionality that comes with their identity. So we see um, in, you know, in education systems here from very early on in the early years, um, right the way through education, that actually the ways in which you will be responded to um, as a black child or young person are very different to your counterparts um, and I think that's really important when thinking about the experiences of black children and young people that actually in so many situations it's actually quite dangerous for them to speak up and act in ways that can signal um, that they would like help and support. I also want to say that the um, I guess the goal and the way in which white supremacy works um, is to discombobulate and disarm. Um, and so often uh, I think that we, as a, as a society, <laughs> um, fail to recognize for those experiences. So um, in the UK, we had a government issued report that came out, I think it was 2020, um, and it was a report that said that institutional racism does not exist, which if you've existed in the UK, you all know that's not true. But to have a government issued report that said that is an example of how white supremacy can be discombobulating and disarming. Um, and I know that for myself and for the peers and the young people I've worked with, um, we can often, I don't want to say confused, but we often fail to recognize the underlying factors that show that you're feeling confused and upset all the time for a reason that people are not validating. And that in itself um, is a very real and warped situation to be in. And so I just want to recognize that as a risk factor um, because often people are having to go through situations where the reality of those situations is never recognized and therefore never rectified. So um, I've got two key points uh, on the slide. So that is that young people from racialized groups are disproportionately exposed to many known risk factors within mental health. And these include being excluded from school, being in care, being represented in the criminal justice system and experiencing homelessness. Um, and this is really key when thinking about black children and young people. It's about looking at it with an intersectional approach and understanding um, not just what is happening to them, but who they are and where, what, what services and systems and institutions they are interacting with over the course of their life. And the other thing is that, as we all know from the pandemic, um, young people from racialized communities have seen their mental well being hit disproportionately hard by the COVID 19 pandemic. We all know um, that really the experiences uh, of 
the quality were heightened by the pandemic. And that is a really um, key thing that has really played out. And um, I know people are terming young people who've gone through the pandemic as the class of COVID. Um, and I think it will be really interesting to keep following what happens to us as we grow up um, with this uh, having happened at such a formative time as well. Could I have the next slide, please? So this slide is really about accessing services. So again, I talk, I just talked about intersection with other things. Um, and really, we have to recognize that for young people who are Black, their pathways and routes into accessing support for their mental health is really different to what is afforded to other groups um, and individuals. So um, you can see here that children from racialized communities are less likely than their white peers to access traditional mental health services in the UK. Um, however, they're twice as likely, twice as likely to access mental health support via a court order um, from social care or a criminal justice related order. Um, which to me is just a statistic that annoys me every single time I see it because it just doesn't make sense. Um, but it does when you look at the backdrop of everything that is happening, but it is absolutely unacceptable. And here I really wanted to talk, um, there's some specific data that we have in the UK about the experiences of young black men and black boys and talks about how they actually access um, support through their, um, their friends or family for mental health, which is obviously a really positive thing, but actually we need to be really aware of um, where perhaps stigma can seep in. So I know that you know, in black communities, mental health um, is still something we are grappling with how to talk about in a sensitive way. Um, and so it's fantastic that black boys are able to access support in their um, close friends and circles in the UK, but actually the data really speaks to the difference with young white men and white boys and how they actually often get to access support formally through doctors, counsellors um, and psychologists. And actually there's a real disparity there um, in terms of being able to access professional help and support, um, but also the earlier data that I spoke to about not having culturally competent professionals in this space um, will allude to why that is. And there's a stat which this one is just really alarming to me. So black children are 10 times more likely in the UK um, to be referred to uh, ch children and adolescent mental health services um, through their social worker than um, rather than through the GP. And that 10 times difference is absolutely astronomical um, and so uh, the work that I alluded to being done by the young change makers is pushing for policy change um, to see this really um, thought about and changed in terms of wider health inequalities and what is happening here in the UK. I'd like to go to the next slide please. So Thinking about experiences of care. So one of the things I wanted to talk about here was that for, um, for anyone who does work with you know, children and young people, you know that they don't exist in a, in a vacuum. They're not, they don't just suddenly appear, um, but actually they have a whole ecosystem around them um, and they will have a family history. And I think one thing that's really important to not forget with black children and young people is the generational mental health that they'll be grappling with. Um, so I know for me, uh, when thinking about stigma and HIV and my experience, um, I also had to grapple with my parents' experience. And I think there's definitely um, should be a lot more data that tracks how families are doing um, and that accounts for their journeys through colonialism, immigration, all of these big things that will have happened over the course of generations that will ultimately impact on the child or young person you have stood in front of you at your local community center. 
So young people from racialized communities in the UK have reported feeling less recognized and understood when talking to their GPs about their mental health needs in comparison to their white counterparts. Um, and again, um, as I alluded to in terms of uh, the experiences of young black boys, um, this is a really off-putting thing. You're not obviously going to want to access care and services if you know that when you arrive there, you're not going to be recognised, you're not going to be understood, and you're not going to be listened to. And so again, really pushing for that systems change that looks at, you know, frontline workers, young people's experiences, policy, and everything to underpin a radical change and shift um, to what happens. And then finally, um, black people are four times more likely to be detained um, here in the UK under the Mental Health Act than white people. Um, and there has been a case really recently, um, which has been yeah, really quite distressing to play out. So it's very much in the public um, kind of school of thought in the UK at the moment. But the yeah, the experiences of people struggling with mental health issues and their links um, and pathways into um, yeah, being criminalized um, for this are really worrying. And I think that there needs to be a, um, a systems change approach that looks at totally flipping the narrative because I feel like in the UK, we're in this place where criminalization and mental health are really coupled together. Um, and actually we're doing both of those things a disservice um, when we do that. And so firstly, institutions, governments, officials, need to recognize um, that this is problematic, but there also needs to be a systems change approach into how, how this is thought about, particularly given um, black children and young people's experiences of the criminal justice system, um, and that they are far more likely to have to interact with that over the course of their lifetime. Could I have the next slide, please? So I've got a question, which is just how does the data I've shared resonate with your experiences? Um, please do put that in the chat. I would absolutely love, love to hear about it. Um, I'll give you a couple of minutes just to think about that. I'm aware I've given a lot of data as well. So please take your time to kind of process it. So Addison says, disappointing, but not surprising. And we've got enraging, but tragically not surprising. Yeah, so uh, just to answer a question that's in the chat, yes, we've got um, a, an act that is a reason to be detained. And that's what I mean. There's really thin lines and barriers in the UK around um, criminalization of mental health. And um, I'm actually doing a program at the moment um, where I was able to go and sit in court uh, last week um, and observe some cases. Um, and unfortunately, pretty much every case I saw over the course of the day was not was not a criminal issue. It was actually um, that somebody had really been kind of detained uh, for mental health purposes and has now ended up in the criminal justice system. So not good at all. Do you have crisis support team instead of police being called? Unfortunately, the case in the UK is that often because people don't recognize um, the boundaries, the police are often called to respond to um, crisis incidents. And so that is that's the problem. They, they're often the first port of call. There are a couple of um, organizations in the UK. Um, there's an organization I'm thinking of called Shout, um, which is providing um, crisis support and they've kind of really grown in popularity. They were who I was thinking of when I referenced um, the Royal Family earlier. They've, they've really kind of um, supported people, but unfortunately most people, they would call the police in the UK if there was a crisis. Um, Karen's uh, giving a shout out to 13th on Netflix about understanding the line of policy and legislation history uh, from so-called emancipation that created the school to prison pipeline. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Owen saying sounds like the experience of many oppressed people here in, in Canada. Um, the data seems accurate given experiences engaging and supporting black youth, says Arifa. Um, in so-called Canada, the racial disparities are similar, low percentage of overall 
uh, population, yep. So high percentage of incarceration, child welfare, mental health holds. Yes, totally agree with everything. Lorraine says, what about the impact of white supremacy and anti-black racism as a critical source of mental health challenges in black communities? Absolutely. Um, I, I alluded to this a little bit earlier when I started about how blackness isn't the problem. It's actually the response to blackness that is. And um, uh, the report I mentioned, the government report that said that institutional racism doesn't exist um, and many other inequalities mean that in the UK, we really struggle with collecting data around how race directly impacts this. Um, and so there, are, there is work being done in that space, but it's, really, it's been really hard to um, find that. And that's why I referenced um, the Young Changemakers because they're yeah, a youth-led group that I've really seen as one of the first um, and biggest examples in terms of leverage and funding that they have to really make a difference um, in that space. But absolutely, the impact of white supremacy and anti-Blackness um, should never be understated in the challenges um, that Black communities face uh, in relation to mental health. Um, and somebody just talked about the gender difference in the impact of the pandemic on youth and the need to pay attention to nuanced differences. Yeah, it's really, really important. And yeah, often the experiences of young black women are totally overshadowed. So next slide, please. I'll go to my parting thought. Thank you so much, everyone, for yeah coming on on this uh, journey with me. I love this piece of art um, that I saw on Instagram one day. And um, I really wanted to end by again, pushing for um, a need for deep rooted systems change. There has to be a radical shift and wake up for people. And when I say people, I mean, um, the people who are in power um, to recognize that there is a problem and to recognize that the ways in which their systems are set up to work perpetuate these problems. Um, but I absolutely love this picture because it always reminds me that there is more than um, black pain and that flourishing is absolutely somewhere we can get to. Um, and so I wanna end with this, black futures matter, black dreams matter, black wealth matters, black hope matters, black joy matters, black education matters, black opportunity matters, black art matters, and Black Lives Matter. And in everything that we do to support young Black people with their mental health, um, it recognizes that Black Lives Matter. And that's why this work is really important. Next slide, please. And so with that, I just wanna say thank you so, so much. I'm really looking forward to the rest of the day. These are my contact details if you would like to reach out to me um, and I will share a couple of the links um, I wanted to earlier in the chat um, as we go through the day. And I'm looking forward to the Q and A, thank you.